So one of the most beloved watch types has to be the chronograph. One of the challenges though with the chronograph, because it is more complex, it is generally going to have its limitations when it comes to how compact the watch and the case can be to be viable for many wrists out there. So as somebody that's very educated in this subject, I wanted to look at some of the best chronographs for those with smaller to medium wrists. So given my own wrist size, this is something that I have navigated through myself. So we're going to begin with some micros and some more niche picks, and then shift to some other more mainstream brands at the end. I will also try to give options for all different price points. However, keep in mind that mechanical chronographs, if we're speaking about those specifically, which we will have some cords options, they're just generally going to be more expensive, especially from a Swiss watch making perspective, with many of those starting at around $2,000. So it's all relative to the complication itself, and and chronographs tend to be more expensive complications than most. Also, say you're not limiting your research to just chronographs for smaller to medium wrists, and you wanna see what's out there holistically in the entire industry. We have a list in Comprehensive Guide to 30 Chronographs to Know in watchmaking in 2024. It'll be linked in the description down below. Similar to the list today, it spans a variety of different styles and price points and includes hands-on photography for many of the watches written about. They have details written about each one of the watches and much more to go along with it. If that sounds interesting to you, check it out in the description down below after watching this video. So to kick us off for this video here, we have three watches that all have the same movement on the inside. But we'll start with the watch that probably most is going to be associated with this movement. Here we have the Siegel 1963. This is a watch that has become a piece that so many people reference as being that first mechanical entry-level chronograph and has created this whole subculture around this watch too. Uh, people really like this approach and design. It does have a Chinese-made movement, uh, the manual ST19 caliber. It was developed with Venus tooling purchased by Siegel from Switzerland. But this watch is an absolute anomaly for what you're getting. You are getting a mechanical column wheel chronograph for under $500. Also, the watch is going to be very wearable. You have a 38 millimeter diameter. A lot of this is being made possible by that movement on the flip side. The thickness is going to not be the thinnest out there, but a lot of that's also coming from the acrylic crystal, the crystal on top, uh, depending on which one you go for, 14.5 uh, millimeters, and a lug to lug of 46.8 millimeters. I'll mention it here and I'll mention it with the other watches included. Great value on the upfront. You do just have to keep in mind the cost for servicing down the road. Chronograph servicing are not the same as a three hand servicing. So you will see servicing costs that could exceed the watch itself in pricing or will exceed the cost of the watch itself uh, in pricing. Our next watch is from the French brand, started in 2017. This is Baltic with their Bicompact 002. One of the first watches that I became aware of from Baltic was some of their early chronographs and that just looked fantastic for the money. They were in that $600 range at the time and they still are generally in that price range, which I think goes to show that some of these smaller brands have a really good pulse on how to connect with the end consumer. This watch also has a seagull movement on the inside available for view on the case back. 38 millimeter case, so very wearable on that front, 47 millimeter lug to lug, water resistance of 50 meters, and I love the just dial design for this one. I mean, I think Baltic, one of the things that you have to say they do exceptionally well is their design. And then for the other watch we have with the Seagull movement on the inside, we have the Laurier Gemini. This was founded by a husband and wife duo that founded the company. And I think they have a great idea and premise for their brand and also just knowing what designs uh, they can really look at from the past and kind of create their own take on it for a modern consumer. 39 millimeters for the diameter, reasonable thickness, and a lug to lug of 46 millimeters to go along with it that will make it wear great on a variety of different wrists out there, especially those with smaller to medium wrists. So I did say we'd have mechanical watches and also some quartz options on this list. And I'd say one of the biggest surges of any micro, smaller independent has to be Brew. Brew has gone crazy. And the watch that was responsible for the craziness was this one. This is the Brew Metric. Has this unique kind of bracelet, kind of single link design that meets the case that has almost this integrated style look from afar 
and a very nicely finished case, but all of this is coming well under $500 while also being very unique with its case size, 36 millimeters, 10.75 millimeters in thickness, and then a lug to lug of 41.5 millimeters. So a very small watch, but this watch changed the game for this brand. Seiko quartz movement on the inside, it's actually a mecha quartz movement. This is the VK68. will have a kind of tick to it or a sweep that will make it almost emulate that of mechanical watches, sapphire crystal. And this watch has absolutely changed the game for this brand. This was a brand that was just founded by a guy, Jonathan Ferrer, who had this background in design, a really nice guy, but now he's basically transformed this into a brand that's I think producing over 10, 20,000 watches per year. I mean, absolutely absurd uh, from a brand that was just started with an idea, uh, having a lot of cool design inspiration too from Italian espresso machines. And you see that with this design. I mean, this goes to show that just because you're not asking for a ton of money doesn't mean that you have to come up with a generic looking watch. And I think Brew uh, is a perfect embodiment of that uh, simple concept. Next up, we have Nevada Grenchen, and this is a chronograph, but it, not fully a chronograph. It's known as the Chronomaster Aviator, Sea Diver. So land, sea, and air is the basic theme here. Nevada Grenchen goes back to the 1920s in terms of the brand name, uh, but it was resurrected by Guillaume Lede, and he's done a phenomenal job in bringing back some of these older names and brands and putting this new life into them with some of their re-releases. This comes with a case at 38 and a half millimeters with its diameter, thickness of 13.7 millimeters, and a lug to lug of 46.4 millimeters. Typically do not see those types of measurements for a watch with a value or a value equivalent movement here like the SW510 on the inside. Very wearable, 100 meters of water resistance to go along with it, making that under 14 millimeters in thickness, I think even more impressive. It's a manual wound caliber. Nevada Grenchen, as mentioned, goes back to the 1920s with the 1926 start date, but really became more popular in the 50s and 60s with these Chronomaster collection of watches, kind of being their, uh, lack of a better term, icon. Now we shift into major brands. And you could argue this first one, you could look at a couple different case sizes from this brand that could work. They have a different case size over 41 millimeters that I actually think wears great and wears like a 40, but I'm gonna actually you know, really lean in knowing that this is for smaller and medium wrists. This is the Seiko Speed Timer with the SSC 813. When we think about Seiko, we think about a variety of different things. We think about the Seiko 5 collection. We think about some of the early dive watches and being a pioneer in that whole realm. We think about the early quartz watch design. We also think about potentially the Alpinus family, the Seiko Laurel Alpinus of the 1950s and how that has become this very fan favorite collection. But the other element of Seiko's history that I don't think enough people consider is that they were among the first in producing an automatic chronograph and producing chronographs more widely across the industry in the late 1960s and uh, early 70s. Uh, here we see a watch that directly looks back to that date with the speed timer. This is the SSC 813, taking some of that design inspiration from those early speed timer references, but then also taking a different approach, obviously emulating some of that of the Rolex Daytona and for under $700, typically you'll find these for over just over $500. Incredible value, 39 millimeter case, 45.5 millimeter lug to lug. Because it is a quartz solar movement on the inside, you're also getting a very reasonable thickness for a chronograph at 13.4 millimeters. Sapphire crystal, not something you see always from Seiko. And a solar quartz movement on the inside, you have a sweeping second hand while getting solar quartz oscillations. That's great upside. You also will have quartz accuracy, amazing set it and forget it combination while getting a sweep with that second hand and making it more viable for wearability because it is going to have a quartz movement. This is in one of those sweet spots in watchmaking. And I would argue probably if you don't have over a thousand dollars to spend for a chronograph, I would just go for something like this. It just makes a ton of sense. You're not having to worry about serviceability and the longevity of the watch. It's going to work in a variety of different environments and it also just looks very good. So it took me way too long to be mentioning this watch on the channel. And this is a watch that I do wanna actually probably cover more extensively and do a full review on. This is the Hanhart Pilot 417 ES. This is a watch that falls in a range and it does a few things that I find to be very unique and also 
probably almost peerless in terms of what it's uh, delivering on many fronts. Now, for one, let's take a step back and Hanhart as a brand. Uh, it has a lot of mixed type of bouncing back and forth with Swiss and German origin. Uh, they were doing some production in Germany for a while. They were doing some production in Switzerland. They were on the border of the two nations. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, they became known for their production of stopwatches. And in 1954, they released their most legendary watch. That was the 417 ES. It was a military pilot chronograph made for the German armed forces. And also apparently Steve McQueen was also famously a fan of the watch. So whenever Steve McQueen is associated with the watch, it always becomes, it seems to be a little bit more cool and beloved by collectors. But then we get into the reason for the modern reissue and why I wanted to include it in this video. And that just comes down to it is delivering on many fronts. One, 39 millimeters, so going to be wearable on a wide variety of wrists, 13.3 millimeters in thickness and a lug to lug of just 46 millimeters. This is gonna wear like a true 39 on the wrist. Water resistance hitting 100 meters, so you're still getting that uh, up specification there. Movement, manual SW510M, movement we've seen in some other watches to this point throughout this video. And then a sapphire crystal on top and just looks that, quite frankly, I think this is just a stellar looking design. You have history to go along with it and a price that's just over $2,000. You're finding these under 2,500 bucks. So these are some of the most attainable chronographs in mechanical watchmaking. And here we are from a brand that I don't think gets enough mention and also has history to back it up. A uh, great choice for those that are looking for something for smaller wrists with a design style that is pretty timeless in its approach. So this next watch is pretty weird uh, in terms of how it wears because there's nothing really else like it. It's the Junghans Max Built Chronoscope. This is a watch that I remember and uh, I hope my former employer from years ago never watches this video, but I remember like on my lunch break, I was just you know doing a little bit of watch you know research and maybe it was sneaking into my actual time on the clock uh, after lunch. And I just kept looking at this watch. I kept looking at this watch. And I remember I just got home from work one day. I'm like, I'm gonna buy this thing. And I don't know what it was about this design that I love so much, but it was just how they were able to take the max build design, which comes from a wall clock design and adapt it to this watch that has perfect symmetry. It's really strange too, though, because this watch doesn't have a running seconds hand. It just has a chronograph seconds at center, uh, but it's just so beautiful to look at. It's one of those watches that of any of the watches I've ever owned, of any of the watches I've ever worn, I've never gotten more compliments than this watch. I, I don't get compliments when I wear watches and I would wear this watch when nobody knew that I was even into watches at that point. They were just like, hey, that's a really cool looking watch. Uh, but the thing I also appreciate about this piece is it's basically all dial. Yes, it's not gonna be the smallest watch from that metric, but it only has 42 millimeter lug to lug distance. So from the overhang standpoint, you're not going to have any concerns about that. You will have a dial basically. This watch, I think that's the reason why it was able to get so many compliments is just because it looks as if it is just a dial on your wrist and so easy to read. And I think very beautiful with the typography on the dial and makes it a great choice for those that like Bauhaus design, simplicity, and also symmetry uh, first and foremost. For this next watch, it's not necessarily the smallest of watches on this list, but it's a watch that given what it is bringing forth with its complication, I think it deserves a mention. This is the Longines Master Calendar Chrono. So you're getting a triple calendar with a chronograph for a watch that comes in with a diameter of 40 millimeters, thickness of 14.3 millimeters, and a lug to lug of 46.3 millimeters. Now it's not the thinnest watch, but at 14.3 millimeters to get both a calendar and chronograph function, that's thinner than a lot of basic value powered watches out there. And I think this also is one of the most complicated watches that you can find for the money in all of watchmaking. The dial pattern is very traditional and romantic with its approach. Although this is not a ask of so many people looking for this combination of complications, it is, if you are looking for it, the best point of value you're going to find in all of watchmaking. Next, we move on to a military pilot watch brand. This is Zinn with the 356. Takes some Flieger design DNA, a brand that was founded by a flight instructor early 1960s and comes forth with this design. So this is a 38 and a half millimeter case, very unconventional case size for a chronograph. You have an option here for an acrylic version for the crystal or a sapphire crystal. That will also affect the total thickness of this watch. So 
If you go for the acrylic version, it's going to be a bit thicker compared to that of the Sapphire, but it also demonstrates that you don't feel the complete thickness on the wrist. Automatic SW500 on the inside. Zinn also is going to finally regulate their movements in their Frankfurt location in Germany. And classic old school design that just works with the Zinn ethos and DNA. So if I had to identify maybe the top brand for creating chronographs for this style and for this type of person, in the luxury segment, I would argue that this is the brand. I have one on my wrist right now. This is Zenith. Zenith from top to bottom within their Chronomaster collection have so much variety when it comes to those that are looking for a chronograph that can wear small and wear great on a maybe more smaller medium sized wrist. I have a Chronomaster original on my wrist. I adore this watch. This is one of my most worn pieces that I have in my entire collection. It is a watch that is unlike many other luxury chronographs because of a couple of things. One, 38 millimeter case. This follows the A386. We'll also look at the A384 and A385 here to follow as a couple other great options. But 12.7 millimeters in thickness, that is Undercutting the height of the Omega Speedmaster is coming under 13 millimeters, which you'll find if you look at many other luxury chronographs, that is kind of the metric that is hard to get under and making this one of the thinnest automatic chronographs you're going to find from this luxury segment as well. Lug to lug is also pretty reasonable. Water resistance of 50 meters and then an automatic El Primero 3600 on the inside. This was unveiled with the Chronomaster Sport being able to track a 10th of a second, still operating at that beat frequency of the original 1969 El Primero at 36,000 vibrations per hour, five Hertz. Just to name a couple other designs from the Chronomaster family, I threw out three different watches you can also look at. You have the Chronomaster Revival A384. This is a panda style chronograph with a unique case. It almost takes on a rectangular case shape. It's almost this tonneau style. It's very unique, very different. Has a case silhouette that's gonna feel unlike anything else you've ever put on your wrist. 37 millimeters, lug to lug of 47 millimeters. It wears like a dream too with that thickness. And I love the pandas dial configuration. You also have the A385. This is similar case architecture and what it's gonna look on that silhouette side of things. But then you have this toasted brown looking dial that is just beautiful to take a look at. The A385, A384, and A386, those are the pillars of the Chronomaster family of design. And how is the El Primero in those early days in the 1960s and early 70s? And then one other piece that follows these same case structure, but a different approach altogether in terms of how it looks is the Zenith Chronomaster Shadow. This is a watch that I have been tempted to just Add to my personal collection many different times because I love the look of this watch. Simple black case that comes in titanium. And then you also have this black dial, white markings. It is so cool, so eye-catching, but doesn't wear so large on your wrist. You see so many watches that draw attention or maybe just are a little bit more eye-catching that are maybe extending too far out, maybe overly ostentatious. This isn't that watch because it's not overly large. It's not doing any of this in this cheap, provocative type of way. It's just an interesting looking watch. Another watch in the last 12 months that has become a fan favorite and I think probably responsible for shifting the thought process many have about this brand, that is Tag Heuer's Carrera Glass Box. This was one of the standouts for me last year at Watches and Wonders. 39 millimeter case, thickness of 14.2 millimeters, and a lug to lug of 46 millimeters. It's falling right in that range, just above that of the Tudor Black Bay Chrono, and then below that of the Speedmasters of the world and the Breitlings of the world, as well as Zenith. So kind of unique position. On the inside, an automatic movement, you have the TH2000, Sapphire Crystal on top, and the Carrera is one of the most iconic design formats of any chronograph in history. So now we have two Omega watches on this list. So the first one I wanna mention is the Omega Speedmaster 38. This is essentially the successor to the former reduced. 38 millimeter case, thickness of 15 millimeters, and a lug to lug of only 44 millimeters. This also is one of, if not the most attainable watch that you're going to be able to get from Omega at full retail nowadays. 100 meters of water resistance. Automatic movement on the inside. This is the Omega 3330. So this is a heavily modified value movement. Column wheel, 52 hours of power reserve, silicon hair spring, while getting a coaxial escapement in the process. So you're not getting into that same master chronometer tier that you'll get with the 3861 and the Speedmaster Professional, but a watch that comes in at $5,600 and is going to be a great option for those with smaller to medium wrists and for those that also love the reduced of years prior. 
I do have one other Omega I wanna include on here. And some of you will be like, a 42 millimeter watch and a video about chronographs for smaller wrists? Teddy, you are insane. No, trust me on this one. The Speedmaster Professional is a watch that can be worn on a smaller wrist. I have worn this on my wrist. It looks amazing in my opinion. I can show some clips of it. I love the way this wears, especially with the newer generation bracelet being a bit finer, having better articulation. It just wears to the wrist well. And if you ever measured a Speedmaster Professional also, you'll notice that 42 millimeters is, does not tell the full story for this watch. It wears closer to a 40 millimeter on the wrist. I love the way this watch wears. Uh, you do have the Sapphire, you do have the Hezolite version. I don't think you're going to see much difference in terms of wear on those watches. Just kind of pick what you want to go for. But if you are doubting me, just try it before you come after me. Try a Speedmaster Professional on your wrist and then tell me it doesn't work. I guarantee you it will most likely work. Breitling is not a brand that typically is associated with watches for smaller wrists. They're most commonly associated, I think, with larger case sizes that we've seen from watches like the Navitimer, uh, as well as the Chronomats and others of the sort. That said, they also produce some stellar watches for those with smaller to medium sized wrists. And I would say the best chronograph that are in alignment with this is going to be the Breitling Premier B09. This was a watch when I put it on my wrist for the first time, I'm like, okay, I gotta have this thing. This thing is amazing and it wears beautifully. I tried on that pistachio green dial. It's a stunning watch. It wears so well. Uh, also the Premier name, I don't think enough people know that this name actually predates that of the Navitimer. It goes back to the 1940s. You have this very simple approach, Symmetry is wonderful on the dial, simple two register layout, that pistachio green is beautiful, but you also have different dial colors that you can choose from now. And they've really expanded out this collection. 40 millimeter case, just over 13 millimeters in thickness, and a lug to lug of 47.6 millimeters, 100 meters of water resistance. And a big reason for the measurements on this watch is because of the Breitling B09 movement. So this is going to be their approach to a manual wound caliber on the inside, helping to keep that thickness down. I would classify this as Breitling's dress chronograph. It's not going to be their best selling collection. I know it's not, but it is still going to be a watch that I would say for those that maybe have never considered Breitling before, could be a great entry point into the brand to maybe consider for the first time. It was definitely a watch that took me by surprise when I put it on and a watch that it's honestly still stuck in my mind almost every single time I talk about it uh, and think about Breitling. So we have to include this watch on here. This is the Rolex Daytona. This is the 126500LN. This is a watch that unlike a lot of the modern Rolex watches, still wears like a mid 20th century design in many ways. 40 millimeter case, thickness is one of the thinnest automatic chronographs you're gonna find in its price segment. Lug to lug of 46 and a half millimeters. This is a perfect ratio for mass market viability. I think that is also the reason why so many people like this watch. We've seen so many gravitate towards the hype associated with this piece, but I think many of us almost fail to recognize or maybe just start to think about why did it get popular in the first place? Yes, there are many reasons for it. Paul Newman, you know, John Mayer shouting this, you know, the Daytona out and talking about how great it is. Uh, and then also I think just Rolex in general, the vintage craze. But another reason why the Daytona I think has taken off is just because it's a damn good watch and it wears so well on so many different wrists, including those with smaller to medium wrists. Recently was also updated with this new reference that have a new caliber on the inside. We we have the Rolex 4131, extended 72 hour power reserve, COSC certified, and a watch design that is timeless and very much uh, duplicated and imitated across the industry. Uh, but that, I guess we can take as flattery. Now moving up to a higher tier of watchmaking, we have the Vacheron Constantin Historique Corn de Vache 1955. This is one of the purest looking chronographs I think you can have on the market. It comes with a case of 38 and a half millimeters, thickness of 10.9 millimeters and a lug to lug of 47.4 millimeters. A big reason for that lug to lug being a bit longer compared to the case diameter is going to be for the lugs. These lugs are ornate and goes with the name are going to be these cow horn lug design. I love the dichotomy of the elegance of the dial compared to these very ornate and bold lugs that you'll find on this watch. On the inside, you have the VC 1142 caliber. This is going to be based on the Lamania 2310 that we've seen across the industry used by several different brands, but they decorate it to a very nice degree. Also features a Maltese cross column wheel. And you also do have some different case options for this watch, including stainless steel, which will make this watch a little bit more attainable, but by attainable, just know what you're talking about. You're talking about Vacheron Constantin. And then for our final watch on this list, this is 
honestly one of, like I think a grail for me. I mean, this is a beautiful watch. This is Alain Gonzona's 1815 chronograph. As you remember, when the datagraph was first released in 1999, the case that they chose was a 39 millimeter case. Nowadays, the datagraph is shifted up to a 41 millimeter case. So what resides now currently as the modern example for a chronograph at that 39 millimeter case size, 39 and a half to be exact, we have the 1815 here. This is a watch that maybe doesn't have the same uh, hype associated or same uh, collectability associated to that of the datagraph, but it is a beautiful design and symmetrical on the front side of the dial and also delivers a movement on the flip side that's available for view that I think is one of the most beautiful in all of watchmaking and really set a standard for manual wound chronographs across the industry. This is the L951.5. I think the 1815 in the modern collection of Longa probably doesn't get the consideration. Maybe some of the other models from the brand do like the uh, Zeitwerk as well as the Longa One, of course, and as I mentioned, the Datagraph. But in terms of delivering on many of the elements a collector would associate and want to have, I would say this is one of my personal favorites uh, that the brand creates. And wears like a dream on the wrist for those that do want a wearing experience that's going to mirror that of maybe the former Datagraphs of years prior. But all right, guys, that is my video here today looking at some of the best chronographs for smaller to medium wrists. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon, really do appreciate that. Closing in on a million subscribers, so any help in getting us there would be greatly appreciated. Also check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.